I've been forced against my will to swim this Hellespont later on today. So, um, yeah, I am a bit worried about being run over by a cargo ship or drowning in the wake. But it's better than dying during a facelift, I suppose. <laughs> Byron had a deep need to prove his manly prowess. And he wrote that the feat of swimming between Asia and Europe here at the Hellespont meant more to him than any kind of glory. It's a lot longer and more hazardous than it looks, so I'm getting some local help. As you can see from the arrows, that, that's our point of uh, travel. It's two miles. Why can't we go quicker in that bit? There's uh, boat traffic there. in Kansas. Oh. We're going to perform a swimming from north to south. Wow, it's a long way. And these are the two boys who are going to be swimming with me? What's your name? Dennis. 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 And what's your name? Dennis Barton. Barton Rupert. Barton Rupert. Hope nice you don't have to, to uh, stop me from drowning. <laughs> <laughs> Byron swam the Hellespont following in the wake of the mythological figure Leander, who did the same to demonstrate his romantic love of the priestess Hero. Byron was very consciously echoing classical romance, but he also loved the sea for its own sake, saying, I delight in it and come out with a buoyancy of spirits I never feel on any other occasion. My hopes of being liberated by the same experience were cruelly dashed. Forced to stop for each Russian tanker that crossed our path, we made it more than halfway across before we finally had to give up. Byron was very courageous in one sense. He somehow decided to be a cripple and to be sexy. Uh, and, you know, that takes a lot of courage and spunk. Uh, for want of a better word. Byron wrote this after um, crossing the Hellespont. For me, degenerate modern wretch, though in the genial month of May, my dripping limbs I faintly stretch and think I've done a feat today. Sweet. Degenerate modern wretch. Was that Byron's view of himself? Two days after swimming the Hellespont, he wrote to a friend, I'm tolerably sick of vice, which I have tried in its agreeable varieties, and mean on my return to cut all dissolute acquaintance, leave off wine and carnal company, and betake myself to politics and decorum. Right. In Turkey, he had seen another bloated empire hell-bent on dominating and suppressing any weak nation within its reach. Byron always loved an underdog, none more passionately than the Ottoman-occupied country he was now heading for, his beloved Greece. Of course, the most exciting thing about a journey is the idea one has of its destination. Even if you never arrive at the destination, even if the destination, as in Byron's case, almost inevitably pisses you off. But here, the idea of arriving in Athens, the center of ancient Greece, must have been like stepping into a, an acid trip. The ancient Greece that Byron knew and admired from school and whose literature influenced his poetry was in ruins and his countrymen were scavenging the remains. He picked a very public fight with Lord Elgin for carrying off large chunks of antiquity back to England. But the larger damage he saw here set him on a crusade that would shape the rest of his life. Byron made a connection between these ruins and what he saw uh, as this incredible Greek submissiveness to hundreds of years of Ottoman rule. Well, the Greek people were ruined, and so he connected the two of them. And um, again, this for him was a seed that was going to grow and grow and grow over the next years. I think everything came into focus for Byron in this first ten-week trip to Athens. He thought, he suddenly saw that poetry can in fact be the bellows 
of revolution. It can fan the flames. And he saw it as another potential way that he could express himself because he was becoming more and more of an outsider every step he made. And of course, Child Harold, Byron's idealized version of himself, took up the cause. Fair Greece, sad relic of departed worth, immortal though no more, though fallen great. Who now shall lead thy scattered children forth and long accustomed bondage uncreate? This was um, a verse, uh, a copy of which, well, the original, I think, is in some university in America. And in answer to all these questions, who now shall lead thy scattered children forth, Byron wrote, Byron. Uh, and long accustomed bonded uncreate, and then he wrote underneath that Byron. Uh, so already he was seeing himself, as usual, center stage, leading Greece into the promised land. Byron fell for all things Greek. Their sensibilities chimed with his, and when he and Hobhouse found themselves watching an erotic puppet show in an Athens cafe, Hophouse professed loftily that nothing could be more beastly. But I'm sure Byron loved it. Byron's sexual appetites were omnivorous. One of his worst poems, The Maid of Athens, is said to be inspired by his love for a 13-year-old girl. But actually, his interests in Athenian youth seemed to lie with a boy. Niccolo Giraud, a beautiful 17-year-old, became language tutor and traveling companion to Byron. They stayed together in this monastery. On a trip with Niccolo, they passed through here. And in a letter to Hophouse, he said, he achieved at least 200 times. Coitum plenum et optabilem with Nicola Giraud. This phrase, plen et optabil dash coit, was the code word or the code phrase among this group of Cambridge aesthetes, these poofs really, this little puffy posse, uh, Methodist they call each other, or citoyen. And um, it was their code word. It was dangerous to write about these things in those days. It was, uh, you know, terrible things happened in England. Uh, you can read about um, people who discovered having sex with other men, being put in the pillory. They often died in the pillory. Uh, th crowds of thousands came to hurl things at them. Shit, dead cats, everything. It was a very, very dangerous game in England to be a poof. So they had to be very careful how they wrote about it. There can be no doubt that he not only had sex with Niccolo, but also that, insofar as Byron ever did, he fell in love with him. And in his original will, he left him 7,000 pounds, an enormous amount of money then, by any standards. Well, I can't think of a nicer place for full intercourse <laughs> to take place, really. It must have been lovely. 